Hey, good everybody. Uh, I'm Greg Murphy, and I'd like to welcome you to The Depot. This is a podcast that is focused on getting to know the transport industry a bit better. Uh, now, we know that transport is the backbone of the country's economy, and sharing knowledge, success, and stories isn't really something that we do enough of. So the team at AutoSense has come up with this great concept to do a podcast about it, and I was, of course, more than happy to get on board and, and do the hosting. Um, in case you don't know, AutoSense is a driver training and safety solutions business doing some awesome things out there within the transport industry. So check them out at autosense.co.nz. Right, so our first episode of The Depot, and it's a pretty big one actually, um, the Great New Zealand Driver Shortage. Um, because there was a big shortage in New Zealand in the transport industry for, for that area. So here's what we know about truck drivers um, and driving trucks in New Zealand. More drivers are leaving the industry than coming into the industry. Uh, the average age is around 54 years old and more than 20% of the drivers are now aged over 60. Uh, only 4% of truck drivers are women and 80% uh, of trucking firms have never employed a female driver before. Uh, there's a perception drivers work really, really long hours, around 70 hours a week. Uh, it's expensive to get licenses and it takes longer for those under the age of 20 to get through the system. Um, add to that COVID, uh, as well as restrictions on immigration, and the problem is really just starting to snowball and snowball and snowball. So today, uh, I am in Dunedin at Dines Transport, where I'm going to have a uh, deep and meaningful chat with CEO of Dines, Matt Horan, uh, to see how the driver shortage has impacted them and, um, and what they're doing about it. Righto, we're underway. Podcast number one, Matt, great to see you. CEO of Dines Transport. Um, we're gonna talk a little bit about you first though. I know it's not your favorite subject, but um, uh, how long have you been down in Dunedin? Because you're not from the mainland. Yeah, that's right, Greg. Now I've been here four years, mate. So uh, I was based up in uh, Hamilton for, for a long time and uh, born in Auckland. And yeah, spent a lot of my time up in the north, but uh, you yeah, made the Made the journey down south four years ago with the family and uh, absolutely loving it here in Dunedin. Yeah, it's awesome. Yeah, it's a good spot. Um, CEO of Dines for two years. Correct. Uh, previously though, you've, you've got a bit of history in, uh, in the transport industry. I have, mate. Yeah, I've been in the transport game for a, a long time now and I've been the general manager of Pacific Fuel Hall, which is a big transport company within TIL Logistics yep. and uh, does all of the fuel movements around the country. Uh, prior to that, I was with Wholesome Cement, managing their uh, transport operation across the country. And uh, yeah, got the opportunity to come down here to Dines and be a part of the team, which was awesome. And uh, obviously carry on with the transport theme and, and the logistics theme, which yep. has been great. Um, and so what was the precursor to getting into the transport industry? Because uh, that's not what you uh, sort of focused on way, way back in the uni days or, or you know, uh, secondary, tertiary education. Um, you didn't, uh, yeah. didn't focus in that area? No, mate, I kind of took a pretty interesting path to get here, actually. I, um, I started out on a journey. I think my, my dad had sort of said to me when I was super young, well, you know, you need to do a business degree. And I was your typical sort of teenager who did the exact opposite of what he wanted to say. <laughs> so I went and searched for the exact opposite. And uh, for me, that was um, outdoor rec. And I got into whitewater kayaking as a whitewater kayak instructor, which uh, I think um, my, my dad sort of looked <laughs> a little bit uh, sideways on, but uh, I kind of loved it because the outdoors taught you heaps about leadership and yep. um, it was just an interesting place to, uh, I guess, lead people, especially whitewater where you'd give briefs to people on the side of the river that all sound great. Um, but once you get in the river, the chaos just ensues and people kind of do their own thing. You've got to be able to obviously gather people's confidence and, and get them uh, working as a team in and, and, and environments where you know nature's chucking a whole lot of things at you. So for me, I, I learned heaps about leadership in that journey and um, would never trade it. Like it was a great, uh, great way to grow. And then I got to the point though where it was a bit difficult to make money out of kayaking uh, in the winter and uh, I kind of just moved into a factory role just trying to 
make ends meet and I sort of ran into a, a guy who picked me out of the factory and sort of said well you know I think he could do more and I didn't really was know. Was that because he saw potentially that, that leadership situation? I don't, or, I, well skill? I, I'd like to say yes yeah. I, I, I'm sure that um, you know I think the key thing was that yeah he was just the, one of those classic guys who did see something more in me and said do you want to go into the to the office and plan the manufacturing and get involved in the that side of it. I didn't know how to use a computer. I didn't know any of that sort of stuff. I sort of just had to have the boys in the factory kind of have my back and make sure that we got everything sorted. But I, I, I grew through that and picked up skills and fell in love with the whole concept of logistics. And that, uh, that sort of got me back into a, uh, my first role um, with a company called McDonald's Lime, which uh, basically had manufacturing, but they also had uh, transport. That was my first sort of uh, engagement with transport and, and I sort of loved the idea of it. Followed my career through a number of different leadership roles and um, found my way into Wholesome and onwards with, with transport. So I think the, the background at Outdoors just gave me a really good foundation around you know how, how, to, how to connect with people, how to work with them, but also yeah, when things are getting tough, um, how to, how to manage in those environments. It's easy to manage when things are going well, but mm. when things are going backwards, um, you've got to know how to work with people and build great relationships so that everyone's walking with you in the, in the, in the headwinds. So. so if you can sort of put it into a sort of a few words then, what, what exactly is it that you, that you do love about transport? I love, I love the people that are in the industry. Yep. Yeah. They're, they're just true, high quality people that um, generally care. There's great banter. It's it's an awesome industry um, to, to be in, but the the quality of the people makes the industry. But it, and it, and I suppose at the end of the end of all that, the tangible results are, are just ob everywhere. They absolutely, and I mean, obviously, there's never a there's never a dull day with logistics. There's always something going on, and I think the. But the, it's a people game, and at the end of the day, um, when you're trying to you know, tackle all these challenges, it's pretty awesome to, to do that with a great crew. And you like problem solving? Love it. Mm. Yeah. Dines loves it, yeah. 100%. Where everyone who works here loves um, a challenge, and, and we've got some amazing people here that, that do some Thrive. awesome stuff. Yeah. Yeah. They yeah. love okay. it. Okay, so let's, let's talk Dines. Um, large South Island based freight business specialising. Um, mostly, I suppose, in transporting dairy and forestry, but you've, you know, you've got dabbles across a whole lot of other realms of, you know, the logistics side of things too. Yeah, we do, Greg. Like we're, we're very much primary centred. So we have uh, obviously forestry is a core part of our business, but yeah, we've got milk as well, which is very important. And we've moved into things like viticulture and all of these industries uh, all blend really well with our equipment and our I guess our life cycle over the whole year so a team gets a lot of variety which is super important for us is that everyone gets something different to do out there and yeah. our customers are awesome uh, we've had long relationships with them and they've, uh, they've really helped us and we've helped them to uh, refine their their logistics and to, to obviously get them match fit which is what it's all about you know yeah so um, numbers Trucks, people, whatever. Yeah, so there's over there's over 200 people within Dimes. So we've got wider networks of people, the partners that we have inside the network that and certainly make it a much bigger business um, at different parts of the year. And we've got over over 150 trucks in our fleet, yeah. and uh, we've got a lot of uh, we've got, we've got a lot of capacity in trailers as well for the for the different things that we do. So it's growing. Um, started at small routes in Tapanui, and it's grown out and now it's across both the north and the south island. So we're very proud of that. Well, just give us yeah, give, and give us a bit of a uh, sort of outline of that that growth and, and the, the period of time. Um, uh, it's a very much family business, but uh, it has expanded greatly. And, and really, we're just, oh, is it a short period of time, really? And, and it's gone in stages, I think, Greg. You know, like we've got, we are a family business, super proud of that. It's, you know, kind of what makes us special. And it all started with Jim and Anita Dines, and they, they started the business out of Tapanui. And 
we were very much in the wood space and a lot of wood chip was being carted and then we expanded through and then Jim and Anita's son, Peter Dines, uh, took over the business and, and did an exceptional job of growing the business with them and pushing that business uh, into other other sectors yep. like the milk. And um, But we've always had our core, we're still in the forestry, but we've grown the business out and you know, 50 plus years now in business as a family business it's it's awesome uh our other shareholder hwr is also a family business mm. and that's that was a very important uh part of why we uh connected with them and and it's 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 very important to us as as, as a core performance cog that we stay family centric it's it's where all the good stuff happens yeah and and I, you know i noticed there's a lot of uh, keywords and and uh, phrases and things around the place associated with it, and you you know you look on on websites and look at uh, like the likes of the the Dines Way, right? And productivity is becoming a lost art in business. The reason why Dines exists is to redefine what pro- productivity looks like for our customers. Yeah, hell of a sort of statement, you know, and it and. Is. And you've got to live by those things. It can't always be easy. No, it's not. I think, though, it's important to know what your purpose is, though. Uh, I think it can get lost in a lot of different statements that um, don't genuinely mean a lot. And I think for us, what we wanted to do is make sure that we had a purpose that genuinely connected with what we're trying to do here and everything we do. And so we do. We sell efficiency to our customers. That's what we do. We happen to do that in trucks. Uh, but we also do it in a number of different other things as well and um, our people have really clear clarity as to what it is we're trying to do for our customers because you have to have that I think if you want to add value. Um, it can all sort of lose shape if you don't quite know what it is you're trying to do and it's easy to say oh we're a trucking company yeah. and we move things but it's more than that and uh, for us we're more than a trucking company. You're a um, so you're solution architects. We are. We are. Our people That's are. That's awesome. Yeah, look, it's a it's a phrase that our, uh, our our team has coined, and and Peter Dines especially has coined, and he's very much the 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 person who started that journey. You know, he's he's very much an out of the box thinker, and everyone who's been hired into this business has to have that DNA. Um, they have to want to be an entrepreneur. They have to think outside the box. Uh, we give people the freedom to to think for themselves here. And some people love that and other people struggle with it. And I think um, the ones that love it just thrive in our environment because we, we challenge the norms. We will think, you know, we'll ask people to, to take risks, calculated risks um, in terms of um, innovation and, and try and find better ways of doing things. And, and, and I think that over our, our journey as a business, we've had uh, a number of things um, come into our business uh, that have added innovation and value to our customers, which is awesome, which is what you want, you know, it's a continuous improvement thing, you know. But, and, but there must be, I mean, with that, and you know, the words culture and team and all this kind of stuff, which which I've been associated with for a very long time, and I've seen um, many people claim that they operate under those those labels. Yeah. And But when you look at the true, sort of meaning definitions of those things and then you look at how they're actually going about it they, they actually they don't connect at all yeah that you know that they, they are quite simple and and i think in what they and what they mean but they're not necessarily easy to actually you know adhere by or live by and and it takes a it does take a lot of work to just to make sure that that's maintained you know so how much effort and, and you know resource goes into into that side of it for you guys to to make sure that you are ticking those boxes for what they actually mean yeah it's a good it's a good question i think you know like for me culture culture is consistency it's defined by consistency um it gets broken when people are inconsistent um with the values and what they're doing and for us the values have to be things that are genuinely things that exist here, not things on paper that we've invented that we want people to be. Yeah. And um, and they've obviously got to be the, the true DNA that want, that makes us successful. And that's why we went through a process of identifying our values, which will always be different to someone else's values. And, um, and that's not a bad thing. It's just that the values that we have here um, because they are so deeply connected to our people and the nature of our people, it's not as hard to maintain because yep. when we hire people here that's the first and the last thing 
that we use to hire someone as, as our values is literally to listen, talk, um, and connect with them as humans. Because even if we are a business, you can see things lose shape very quickly in bigger businesses or bigger structures where all sorts of acronyms and language starts to occur in the business. That's not what you use down the street. Yep. And for us, it's about the fact that we want to connect with our people and have great relationships with them. And if we have that, then hopefully our culture will um, stay strong. And over 50 years, I think there's been a fantastic natural evolution of that here. And we've just started to decode it a little bit more because it was something that was happening, but we needed to make sure it was um, visual for the next yeah. generation so yeah. they can follow up. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, and that's important that, you know, that uh, everyone's living by it, no matter which layer or where you sit in the, in the you know, so-called triangle yeah um you know everyone needs to be bought into that and yeah yeah i think quality of the language that you speak in terms of its simplicity and the consistency of your behaviors uh in a business or at home in a family defines how things function and when people don't uh deliver that and i've seen it myself um you know through my my career uh that's when you see things fall apart as uh, when some a rule that was in place or a, a stance that was in place is suddenly changed or adopted um just because of an event and everyone looks at that and then that shifts the culture and so i think culture is an evolving thing and yeah it's a thing that hundreds of books have been written about and it's easy to market it but i think it takes it takes a lot of work uh, when you're trying to do some when you're trying to breed a culture that isn't you, but when you understand who you are or who your people are, yeah, it's easy for culture to um, be maintained because you're connected with it. And yeah. I think that's kind of where I feel our people are deeply connected with the culture. We all look at each other and know the DNA that's within us. Um, we're all. Um, dines through and through and um, we really love our company and we don't just say that we actually love it because it's it reflects who we are here as people so that's pretty cool yeah it is very cool um uh i really appreciate that you know it's it's good to hear it too um so with all that in mind um you know creating that 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 culture and and that buy-in from everybody um you know you would think then you know, you'd have people flocking here, hand over fist going, I want a job, I want to be here, right? Although, you know, not everyone's going to realise how good this place is until they start here. But uh, one of the biggest issues that um, in transport now, um, uh, which everyone is having to deal with, is the, the shortage of drivers. Um, so what things are you guys doing here at Dines and, um, and how is it impacting you? Yeah, okay, so I'll start with the impact, Pete. I mean, definitely like all of our um, brothers in transport, you know, like it's tough, you yep. know, and uh, ultimately you need people, you need people make your business, and so you need them, and, and certainly not being able to access uh, resources is super, super challenging. We've known for a long time that, uh, you know, a shortage of drivers would have started appearing. I think COVID sort of you know, accelerated that issue, but it's been here a lot longer than COVID. Yep. And, uh, you know, for us, we've looked at it from a number of different ways. I think the the first is we've started an academy um, some time ago. Uh, it's, it's called the Dines Academy. It's really, really focused on trying to bring in um, the next generation of, of, of people into our business and into our industry, but it's also accommodating the ones that want to change their careers as well and giving them a shot and coming in. And we had a number of people during the pandemic uh, come to us and, you know, wanted to jump in a truck because they could sort of see the the, the benefits of it or yep. that uh, they, they may have been in tourism and needed to change their careers. Yep. So that was, you know, from our side, I guess, uh, an opportunity. And I think the, 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 the cadetship uh, model and the academy uh, have been probably the thing we're most proud about in this space. I mean, there's, there's some big challenges there, but we want to breed uh, young people into our business. So the, the the actual course they come in on, the development course, is focused on bringing kids in and building their character. So it's we want them to potentially be truck drivers, but we may want them to be ultimately leaders of our business. We, we, don't, we don't set that role. We pick those people out based on their their character 
and and, and the qualities again the values you know do we see the values within them and, and then also maybe highlight a specific skill that yeah. that might be way off in, on a different tangent that they didn't and didn't see potentially mate yeah, yeah i think the the first point is just getting them in getting them exposure and it's the simple things that build character like getting exposure to meetings talking to people coming to work on time um, getting structure all that stuff's a part of a part of our development program uh, des who's our cadet manager does an exceptional job of uh, effectively um, mentoring these um, kids and so we have a number of uh, female and male um, cadets that come into the business and they've done they do a range of tasks here it's not just getting in a truck but we ultimately would love to see them if they are super practical and want to be a truck driver we'll, we'll try and get them through the the licensing uh, in a timely manner and give them exposure to a, diff, a number of different trucking opportunities to get their skills up but what we, what we do see is that a number of them are true leaders yeah and hopefully they'll you know one of them will take my seat and others that's that's success right if we can get them to believe um, and see that those opportunities exist so the, the academy is helping bring a number of them in and that's a starting point i think the the status at the moment around getting drivers is difficult and so obviously we're trying to make sure we communicate to you know the wider you know transport community and driver community what we have to offer here in terms of the variety of work we have and the culture that we have and i think um we've been very lucky we've got a lot of driver retention here we had our 50th celebration um a year or so ago and uh we had numerous drivers that were plus 20 years i think we had a couple that were plus 20, 40 years so we've got a really loyal group here um but we're definitely still impacted by the shortage uh, we have a lot of work to do and some of it's seasonal and you've just noticed more and more the challenges there so we're working harder to bring those younger ones in and when the one and when we have people who want to change their career we also have got the cadet program to help with that as well in the academy so we try and blend them all together hopefully get some more talented people not an easy situation uh, for the industry being uh, to, to face but i think we feel like that's where we can do the most uh, good especially locally here in dunedin um, we really want to obviously breed as many uh, talented people as we can so hopefully we see more of them come through and so with the academy and the cadetship um uh, do you have cycles of that or, or, or can anyone come at any time to join? Anyone, and then... anyone can apply, Greg. I think we've actually had a bit of a waiting list for some time now, which has been quite, um, well, it's quite cool to see. Because that's a lot of resource to put into that, right, too? It's huge. Yeah, it's huge. So we interview them. Not everyone uh, makes the grade yeah. and some of them get given uh, a lot of a lot of pointers to go back and you know work on and bits and pieces. We make sure that people understand though what they need to work on, but it's certainly not just a, a, a breeze in type exercise. There's a selection process, and uh, as I say, uh, our website gives you access to the cadet program, and you can uh, submit your interest, and then we we get going with having chats and finding out. Every cadet gets interviewed by myself. Yeah. Um, so I'm super interested in who they are, and they also get interviewed by Des and the uh, the team in the academy. Would, um, and do you tell them a bit about your story? Yeah, I do. Because actually. I mean, it's I mean, it, it's important that you know they see the boss, the CEO sitting there um, behind the desk, and you know there's be a preconceived sort of idea about you know you know how you got there. They probably yeah. don't think that you know. What, yeah. where you started and where, what you were doing and how you've ended up where you are. Yeah, I definitely do have that chat. I'm always interested to know a little bit about them in terms of their passions, but I do show them our org chart, which we've flipped around the other way, where the drivers are at the top of it. Yeah. And so I really want to show them that, look, the titles mean nothing here, yeah. including mine. At the end of the day, we don't even have our titles on our business cards because we're all just doing something different in the business to make the machine uh, perform. And so we try and make sure they understand that all of these roles are important, and they are. And everyone's just got a different function and to not get hung up on those titles because we're not, we're not pretentious people here. And I think that... We give them hopefully a feeling of confidence that uh, we're a family and you can come into our family and hopefully be whatever you want to be um, and for us that that's that's awesome if, and if we can get that talent to to obviously contribute to the industry then we're doing our job in my opinion and that's that's what we're passionate about so hopefully that carries on so you've got uh 18 to 25 age group 
um, okay. as a 30 month process and, and then the uh, Dines Accelerator 25 years plus 18 months and that's obviously around just the, a lot to do with the licensing it's issues and restrictions. Pretty much yeah we sometimes have people that might have class 4 licenses when they come and so they can move yep. a lot faster than someone who's starting on class 2 but at 25 plus you can obviously take a number of um, courses in between the licensing to speed up the, the, the time frame between the license tests. So we definitely can get them in and going a bit faster, whereas the younger ones we're just focused on trying to give them life experience and exposure to a range of different things. And some of those things are just very simple things, you know, like um, as I say, being involved in tour box meetings and seeing how people interact and all that stuff that people forget. But they're the qualities that grow your character and um, just experience, putting them in different environments. And they have been fantastic. The, the, the kids in the cadet um, group are absolutely an essential cog in our business now. They do so many important things for us to make our business successful when we're under pressure. And then obviously it's fantastic when we can get them in the licensing as well and obviously in behind a wheel of a truck. So, um, But regardless of being in a truck, they still do some awesome stuff here that uh, makes the machine go. So it's, it's pretty cool to see. And they keep us honest. Um, they're good characters. Um, a lot of young people have some really good ideas and yeah. they, they stress test our business. And that's what we want. We want to be challenged. The business can't stand still. Well, they got different, they got, you know, there's different ideas now. You know, there's, there's this generation, different ideas on what success is and what they want, what they're looking for, what's, what they see as obtainable or yeah. achievable as well. Yeah, that's right. I think connecting, that's the most important thing that we've recognised moving forward is just connecting with people individually and recognizing that every person here has professional and personal aspirations and you need to understand what they are and they will be different between the different age groups and what people are, are looking for and our jobs to make sure we tailor the journeys here for everyone so the journey when you get to retirement is hopefully that you've been with dimes that whole journey that's our ultimate goal and um, that we've provided you all the pathways on the different paths of your life in terms of what you need and I think that uh, the younger ones when they come in here they, they, they're they very very smart when it comes to ITs they're very smart at looking at processes and saying you could do that a lot a lot smarter and they, they, they do they give us a good stress test and I think that's um, that's awesome and hopefully if we can help them grow their voice and and help them see how to you know kind of you know grow their grow their um, capabilities in our environment and i feel like it's a, a great marriage you know of um, two partners coming together and that's what it's all about with the academy bringing people in and us both doing something and adding value you know yeah so what do you what do you put it down to then the um the struggle and now the storytelling around the transport industry and and which i don't think you know it has been missing right i think it's been missing for a long time um the you know putting the industry on a pedestal mm. to actually let the nation know how you know they turn up at the supermarket or they turn up at the hardware store or they turn up at the petrol station they turn up and and just just they want to they pull the bowser out and there'll be petrol in there and they'll turn up at the hardware store and they'll get their whatever the item is they're looking for and and they turn up and they flip the you know the bag of flowers on the shelf it's just an expectation that all that's going to happen so you know what's gone wrong that the industry is is fighting so hard now to to encourage and, and attract people to be a part of it yeah it's, it? A, it's an education piece i think definitely i think you know like society is different to what it was 30 years ago and i think you know a lot of people who might have grown up on a farm or understood where their food comes from you know with a lot of you know people moving into cities and city life it's it's not uncommon to be fair to find a number of city people who aren't aren't quite aware of how things get in the supermarket like you say and behind that there's also the transport as well and so i think the industry as a whole including including us at dines i recognize we probably haven't done the greatest job of marketing our industry or making people aware of what we actually do they might see the truck down the road but it's putting all the other dots together so they understand the flow of of how logistics works the pandemic's given us a great advertisement of 
what's been going on and what happens yep. when it doesn't work. And a real focal point yeah. on yeah. Yeah, but it wasn't because the industry pushed on and did that. I think our job's now to take that and make sure that people understand what logistics networks look like and, and what happens when they fail, but more importantly, what opportunities now exist in there and that there's some exciting roles that are just as good as any other industry, if not better, as we see shortages where there's scarcity creates demand. And I think that logistics will be a, an exceptional industry to be in in the next 10 to 15 years, but we need to educate people better, especially at say careers, fairs or what have yeah. you, about who we are. Image, Yeah. fixing an image. Yeah, the old you trucker know, stereotype. And type thing, you know, like that's, you know, the. Yeah, the boys all like a pie, I don't mind one either, but that's not everything here. And we've got a lot of other people doing a number of different roles here, you know, in safety and um, IT and, 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 and dispatching and logistics, uh, those sorts of things. They're all big, really important roles. And they're also jobs that you could do in a number of different industries. And so I think there's a lot to offer, but we've got to step forward as an industry and start marketing ourselves better. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it, because there's, I mean, the options and what what people want to do, lifestyle, all that kind of stuff. I mean, them, you know, the stereotype around, you know, 70, 80 hour weeks and working six and a half days a week, all this kind of stuff. I mean, there's a, the new young generation, new generations. They're not, um, they don't want to be thrown away every minute of their day at work, do they? No, we've got to find a balance. I mean, there's definitely work to be done, and I think that I think people do want to work, but they also want to achieve goals, and we've got to recognise that some of those goals look a lot harder to them than they might have done 20 years ago but there are opportunities and we want people to see the combination between delivering productivity and receiving value um, as, as a person and trying to blend that because productivity in New Zealand needs to improve there's no question about it and yep. I think that you know a number of the sectors we've had that are, are suffering you can see that productivity is, is the piece that's rearing its head here where um, as costs increase um, and are getting passed on, there's no, there's no productivity in the mix and, and it's just sort of starting to become a black art. It's starting to get suffocated by unnecessary, um, unnecessary sort of uh, structures and rules that um, you know, just slow things down. I mean, there's, import there's some important stuff that needs to be done, but productivity is, is something that often just gets neglected. But if you look at some of the other countries like the likes of the Singapore's and stuff like that, they have focused on productivity and value add. So the, the, the stuff they're selling to the world is value add. And then you can go and obviously then deliver higher wages. You can give people more. And I think, you know, we've got to look at that uh, across the across the country. I guess it's a broader topic, but I think um, in our industry as as well, we need to we need to be smarter and um, and there's a lot of cool ways to be smarter and, and we definitely think that logistics can offer people a great career and a great way to manage their um, manage their aspirations and deliver what they want over their life. Um, but we've got to advertise it. To yeah. Them. And I don't. Yeah. We haven't done a lot of that, but we want to do more of it moving forward. Yeah. Um, so is there is there a, is there a, uh, an absolute specific area of the that whole logistics? Is it just drivers? that there's the, a major shortage of, or there, is it just across the board and all the different aspects of it? It's across the board, yeah. yeah. It's across the board, Greg, like there's... So in your business, oh. I mean, uh, you've, got, you've got people on the ground, there's forklift drivers, there's, there's you know, uh, office, in IT the office. people, yeah, every, everyone, you know, like we try and find anyone, and I'm sure yeah. every industry would just tell you the same thing, you know, like there's, there's a shortage of people in general, there's obviously gonna be a, a, a massive shift of people going overseas, um, potentially Shortly. In, the, in the coming months yeah and so the it's a challenge across the board but truck driving is like the the lifeblood the drivers are our you know a, a massively important piece of our business and you know ultimately if the truck is not moving mm. doesn't matter about the rest of it pretty much mm. pretty much so we we've got to work on all those facets it's definitely um it's challenging times but with challenges like that there's opportunities and so i kind of get excited about the opportunities and and there's plenty there and that's what our team's excited about as well okay well that's the environment so what do we do about it yeah um and i think we've obviously started with the academy and we're constantly thinking about the next ways forward and you know, sometimes too it's about retention of people and that comes back to those family values and how we treat people have you had to you know on top of all the other 
processes and the academy and the cadetship and everything. I mean, uh, for um, retaining people, and uh, have you had to look at incentivising and 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 other ways to to make sure someone doesn't jump over to somewhere else? A little bit. I think you know there's been elements of an uh, in- incentive, but I think a lot of it is how we treat people. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, we, you can often just grass see is, someone. Grass isn't always greener. Yeah, and look, from our side, what we, we definitely do is, uh, you know, there's certain situations where someone might want to leave and sometimes we accept that they might want to go and see other environments because they've only known ours and, you know, our hope is they'll come back and many of them do. Yeah. And I think, though, it's the quality of the conversations uh, that need to be had uh, with people that defines whether they want to stay here because it's not all about money. Uh, I definitely know that for a fact. I know that people want to be treated with respect, and they want to they want to feel like they're part of a team, and that's what we focus on in the way that we we treat people, which shouldn't be that difficult, you know. Like it's just just acting like a normal human, to be fair. But it gets lost in the business structures and you know the complexity. And what that we think is important. Yeah, and all the acronyms and things like that. Look, I'm not interested in them here. Yeah. Um, I'll speak to someone in normal English. We'll have great conversation. Um, that's that's important to me. Um, I think that we don't want to overcomplicate uh, the way we talk and interact, and that's where people sometimes get lost in the system and want to leave. So, yes, there's probably incentives, and yes, there's a number of different things around that. But I, I would say that our big focus is on how we treat people. Yeah, now, I seem you're very proud of that and, and confident about it too. Um, so, for, if you uh, turned up as a brand new cadet today, yeah. What's the, what's the first week involved? What does the first week look like? Because it could probably be quite, it could be, you know, quite, uh, you know, you could be taken back by what you see around here. Yeah, look, it's, it's interesting. It could be anything. Um, there's a lot of different things going on at different types of the year. And I think what we try and do is just settle, the, settle them into some basic stuff. We have a wheel polisher here. So that's um, uh, one of our pride and joys. And so that machine uh, is dedicated to the cadets. So they have to run that machine and polish all the wheels and make sure that uh, they're all looking sharp. And it's just a, an introductory task of responsibility. Yep. So that's your machine, you handle that, you, you, you work that, and they do a great job. Then we move them on into other tasks. And Des kind of works with each individual um, based on their characteristics. You know, it's a bespoke program, I think. You can't, you know, leadership is, is to me, it's not a course and everyone's got leadership in different ways and styles and so you've really got to work with the individual to um, unlock that and I learned that a lot from the outdoors you know people yep. have got it in them but they'll, they'll they've got different styles yeah different 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 walls yeah our job's yep. to unlock it's amazing, their right? potential right mm. and to get the performance out of them so that's what we do we kind of see what they like in the different environments we'll put them into different tasks they might go into our warehousing business, as you say, they might get a chance to hop on a forklift if they've got the license. Uh, they might just hop in a truck with a driver and go out and see the different runs. And so Les, uh, Des just basically puts that program together as he sees it. And that sort of helps grow them. And then eventually we put more structure in play and months later they've got kind of a more rigor to, to what they're doing. But at the start it's about just just you know, getting in the environment, enjoying it, talking to people and getting their confidence up, making sure they're turning up on time, mm. making sure they're looking sharp with their uniforms and just getting the basics going and then, yeah, hopefully from there just, you know, building off it. Yeah. yeah. Um, let's uh, back step a little bit, just uh, COVID. Um, uh, how, did, how did you guys, how did Dines survive through that, that period? And I mean, initially, when not no one knew knowing anything, what was going to happen, how it was all going to work. I mean, how how did that? Um, uh, how did you guys control that that initial phase, especially um, learning yeah. about what what needed to be done? What did you you know, and what did you put in place? Well, I think COVID was a such it was an opportunity as much as a threat. Uh, I think it was an opportunity for us to make sure that we stood up like we wanted, like we always want to, and. Uh, step forward and do what we say we're going to do which is look after our people so a number of our people were up in um, viticulture having to do grapes and that was sort of given an exempt to, to carry on so it was a very challenging situation so we had to focus on our communication with our team and they you know, I, I will forever be thankful for what our staff did during that situation they were 
all just uh, amazing, um, amazing human beings in terms of their ability to stay there um, calmly and work through it. We obviously want to make sure that they were safe the yep. entire time, but we had a job to do to get the harvest done because grapes got to come off and there's a few people that like them. People, so, people got to drink their wine. Yeah, there's got to be some stuff that's got to be done there. Um, our forestry uh, business was completely in lockdown and so uh, we actually came off our, uh, a lot of our milk uh, was already quiet so we didn't have too much to do there. But we need to look after our people so yeah, we did. Um, we made sure they knew that uh, no matter what um, they would get paid. We're not, and this is before thinking about the wage subsidy or anything like that. It's irrelevant to us. Um, we just need to make sure that they knew that everything was okay and, and then ultimately what we got out of that was when there was a couple of opportunities where work needed to be done, uh, everyone came to the, to the party and they all stood up and said, yep, put their hand up and said they definitely work. And so it was a murky, crazy sort of period, but I think, uh, you know, obviously trying to understand where it would end or what it was uh, was challenging, but it was an opportunity for us to demonstrate our values again and again. Mm. Because that's when it matters. When the, when the going's tough, that's when those things really matter. They and pay off, yeah. Yeah, and for us, it wasn't a case of having to get ready for it. That was second nature. All of our people stood up. All of our leaders here treat um, people well every day. And we went out and had those conversations and just connected with people and found out what's going on. And we got through it. Um, thankfully and uh, it was certainly it was super challenging for the local economy here in Dunedin as well as it was across the country so um, thankful that that's a little bit further behind us COVID's still creating disruptions yeah, yeah. Um, gotta live with that uh, but we're just working through that and, and obviously just trying to find a rhythm and I think that's the evolution thing, well it's right? changing it, it, it's forever changing there's nothing you know what's right this week is not going to be the same next week or that's what you right, do this mate. week is not going to be the same yeah I think you just got to you just got to evolve and that's that's kind of in our warehouse mm. it's all good yeah back to the cadetship and the um, academy Dines Academy what's the how do you go and promote that how's that being pushed out there to create awareness around the fact that it, that it exists yeah, it's, it's a good question, Greg. I think there's two, two ways. One, one on our website, so dines.co.nz, we've got a page that explains all about the cadetship and it helps people see exactly what we're looking for in, in a cadet and, uh, and also for someone who's looking to maybe change their career. And then there's a, a simple application form that they can fill out which will uh, find its way to the academy and we will reach out to them. Uh, no matter who's applied, they will get reached out and we will have chats with them um, to sort of find out a little bit more about them and what, they, what they're all about and where they want to go and, and then see if we can uh, accommodate them into the uh, academy. Ultimately, uh, we've, we haven't got like an intake process. We, uh, we wait for people to apply and we reach out to all of them and, and then we work through the opportunities we have in the business to, to bring them into the academy because ultimately we've moved a number of people through the academy which is exciting. We've got a number of drivers, uh, female and male, that have moved right through to class five licensing which is awesome and when that happens we obviously have spots we can bring through. And we'd love to grow the academy even more uh, which is kind of part of the goal but the website's the main place where people can uh, engage with the academy. And the career, careers advisors, schools and things sort of aware of? Yeah, the careers fair uh, or advisory um, uh, channel is definitely the other area that we're working on hard now. Um, yeah. So we've got a careers fair coming up and that's, that's a big focus for us about again that conversation around how we market ourselves and the and the academy but more so just the actual industry as well so that's the big focus and we'll probably just keep pushing on with those career fairs making sure that we're getting to the the coal face and then ultimately to um yeah we have a number of referrals word of mouth yeah uh, a lot of that stuff goes on too which is pretty cool and as i say we've got we've certainly you cast a pretty big net don't you really yeah not not short of applicants yeah which is awesome uh but we definitely need to uh keep seeing more young people come through and more people who want to you know change their careers yep. so the, the systems are all there and the avenues to communicate are all there and um really need to bring up because it's not something that um, is goes uh, seems to go hand in hand is is girls women yep. you know in the industry and especially in the driving trucks part of the industry you know um, it, it you know why is why is it so hard why has it been so difficult you know you know because they you know 
girls do an amazing job and you've got quite a few that have come through that are just yeah. you know are just proving you know absolutely their worth obviously and it what we need more yeah. um, females to be uh, to be thinking at this path right yeah and look it's perception and marketing yeah and ultimately that's just led to a point where you know some people don't pick up the phone and I think that don't need to be wearing your stubbies and your singlet through the middle of winter, eh? Nah, yeah, you can, I mean, yeah, we definitely yeah. have a fair bit of that here, but I think, <laughs> I think at the end of the day, there's, there's, there's not a requirement. Yeah. And I think um, it's been pretty cool to see, uh, you know, that journey with a number of the, the awesome ladies that have come in here and they have great attitudes and they jump on the trucks and they, they set new standards for us, the challenge you know, processes and systems, I think that's pretty cool. And ultimately, we've yeah, been really proud of uh, a number of the ones that have gone all the way through to class five. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so set a new benchmark in that space. But uh, I think marketing and perception is is where it all starts and, and you know, changing those, those thought patterns that people naturally get from passed down from generations. So we've just got to do... Yeah, ste- just again, work. stereotypes, right? That, yeah. uh, not accurate anymore. Yeah, yeah, but the industry's got to step up and do yeah. something, you know. We can't just sit there and go, oh, well, you know, we've got to be the ones that front that. And so that's what we want to do, and that's where the career fairs, I think, are probably the best place for us to start. Mm. Mm. Yeah, well, it's, that is awesome. Um, right on to a little bit of, uh, you know, pitching this, the sponsor's uh, calls here. I mean, uh, AutoSense is the, is the sponsor... And they provide driver training and safety solutions in the industry, as you know. And you've got some involvement with, with AutoSense through uh, a lot of Guardian technology in in, in your fleet. Um, so, what a bit of an overview of what uh, Dines' approach is there to that that driver safety space. I mean, you know, it can be a lot of tokenism around that too, because it's a difficult. It's a it's a, there's a lot of work and resource that needs to go into, you know, to the evolution of of driver safety as well. Yeah, there is. And I think that's easy to say um, a lot of fancy words about yeah. it. And I think at the end of the day, you know, drivers are professionals. That's the starting point, just like a pilot, they're a professional. And so they need constant upskilling uh, to keep their edge. And, you know, we've got driver trainers inside our business that obviously do a lot of that work um, and, and then help keep uh, our our team match fit, you know, and, and we invest a lot of money into into safety and, and training because, uh, you know, there are our prized assets out there uh, in the battlefield. So we've got to they're representing sure, too. Absolutely, we've yeah. got to make sure they're safe, and uh, that's our job. That's my job is to make sure my people are safe. They've got all their resources, and they can go to the battlefield confident. And I think that starts with the quality of the trucks we have. Um, you know, we spend our expense on what we what we have here. Um, purely because we want the safest, highest standards in the equipment and then also with the training we offer, uh, that's that's a real focus to ensure that our drivers are of the highest calibre at all the times. Uh, we treat our drivers with a lot of respect around driver training too, you know, it's, uh, it's not, not a mechanical process. Um, we certainly want to acknowledge the drivers that are at the, the top and we use a lot of technology to help um, you know, acknowledge their performance and, and, and drivers do want to be acknowledged yeah um, i think that's just human nature yeah. right they're professionals and yeah. a professional wants to know that he's at the top of his game so we put a lot of effort into into that driver training space because uh, that's how you breed good people right and uh, you bring them in they're often very very good but you've got to maintain performance a bit like a sports team you know like you've got to train and that's what driver training and other other initiatives are it's just keeping your match fit so um you know and I know there's a lot of operators out there that uh, do an amazing job in this space, but it's it, it, it's a message that needs to be sort of spread f- far and wide outside the industry into just everyday mainstream people moving around in vehicles. Because again, it's the, you know, just because you've got a license that says you're allowed to drive, it doesn't mean that you're as good as you can possibly be or as safe as you can possibly be. And, and it is like everything else, you, you need to, you know, have the reboot, you know, there's a new program come out, you've got to take it on, you've got to have it installed, you know, to get the best performance. Yeah. And, and you know, we, um, you know, that obviously is really important in the transport industry, um, but it's it, it should be important across the board, shouldn't it, no matter no matter what you're doing? Absolutely, mate. I don't think it's, it's, it's specifically what we're doing, but I think it is, as you say, it's, 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 it's ultimately just recognising 
it's recognizing i think you know with trucking as well that it is a profession you know that's, yeah that's, totally once you get that bit mm. then the next question is oh if you're a professional what does profe- what does a professional do and everyone who is a professional definitely trains they definitely get stress tested and i think that that's um something that we just see as sort of and it's, it's important it's not out to the side it's just part of what we do and i think we've you know, I know a number of other transport operators do a really good job in that space too, and I think it's, it makes our, our roads safer. But we make sure that we've got the best gear yep. and the best equipment and the the safer the, the safety tools that matter, the things that are actually going to help our, and protect our people. And you know, it's something that I'm personally really proud of here at Dines is that we you know we certainly don't second guess that space, and I think that it hopefully helps see that if you're a professional driver. Um, with massive standards, this is a great place to be, and, and hopefully keeps good retention here and you know, attracts more drivers. So, I think you know training is super important. So, um, and with with what we see through um, you know uh, Guardian by seeing machines that is distributed by AutoSense and stuff, we, we've you know I've been blown away. I mean, this is one of my attractions to being involved with with AutoSense was was seeing some of the statistics around fatigue distraction issues, yeah. which. You know, it's hand in hand with with driving long haul, driving trucks long distances. I mean, it can be. It, I mean, they are professionals. You know, yeah. this is the thing. It, it's a, um, it's it's it can be a monotonous task, and it's got to be something that you you know you really do buy into to to do at the best levels you can. Yeah. Um, those things, fatigue, distraction alone uh, within the business. Just uh, you know, quickly, uh, I suppose a bit of an overview of how you've seen that impact and and how important it is to work with it. Well, look, I think, you know, the reality is that fatigue and distraction is the number one risk and it's facing that, you know, it's a ghost fatigue in yep. my view. Yep. Um, it's great to have log books and we've got electronic ones and that's great for compliance, but fatigue can impact anyone and that's something that we faced some time ago um, and, and, and from a, you know, from my perspective, I'm pretty passionate about it and the fact that we need to... My job is to make sure that I know that everyone, that we're doing the best we can do out there to protect our people and fatigue was a topic that needed to be tackled. Um, it's not talked about a lot and, and it certainly happens and it doesn't matter who you are. And so it, it's not selective. No. It just, it's, it's ultimately a whole lot of things. Can I tell uh, today how many people might have watched, say, Netflix and have had a great sleep or, or anything like that? No. And so if I can't answer that and I can't answer the question who's fatigued and who's not, you certainly need tools. And and that's why we went down this journey with AutoSense to, to make sure we had the right tools in play to, to protect us from our biggest risk. Um, a number of the other risks in our business are all being addressed by different things, but that was the one that uh, was like the ghost, you know, in terms of knowing when it would appear and where it would appear. And, uh, and ultimately, you know, we have a duty of care to the, the people on the road as long as the, uh, as well as the people inside our business to make sure that we can satisfactorily say that we've got not complete control of that topic, but we've got we've got tools that support us in managing it. Yeah. And I think that if you're a really high class professional operator in our industry, you have to have those tools to be in that category. And, and you know, and this is where the tech side of things you, you know, we've had to we've had to We've had to understand it and accept it, right? Because, you know, it's now there. It's now identifying issues. I mean, I mean, this stuff is still, it's pretty new. It's, it's in its infancy still, right? It's still mm-hmm. growing. Um, and just over 4,000 units throughout the industry um, now mm-hmm. in an industry that's, you know, quite a lot bigger than that. Um, so that, that, that acceptance of that is really challenging. And you've got a, a people's council, we do. Right? which is a, a lot of safety focus on that. Has that been an important part of of being able to um, get people on board with with those changes? Because we know a lot of drivers have been pushed back and been against, you know, the stuff that's, you know, telling them what to do or, you know, making them or trying to make them better or help them through it. There's been a lot of pushback around it. There, absolutely there has. And I think the People's Council was formed because we wanted to do things differently in safety. We wanted to simplify safety. And, and the way that we talk to people and make sure that they have the, the stuff they actually need uh, to do their job. And so we formed the People's Council because we believed that we needed to get a greater voice within the organisation. We need to know the pulse. It's all good for me to say, I think I know what yep. people want. 
but uh, the People's Council was formed on that basis. No managers allowed at the council. We have an independent chair, and the drivers speak candidly about what's going on, what what the focuses are, and managers also put forward um, concerns about things that are going on in the operation. Now, fatigue was the, one of the first things that went through the People's Council. Right. So it played a big role in our journey and adopting the technology because what we wanted people to see was that the fatigue camera is for you and your family it's not just for us it's for you and your family and once you understand why the technology is there um, adoption was a lot quite faster and it's obviously just treating people with respect um, as we've talked about a number of times in the culture space it's when we've got something that's a bit contentious it's often contentious because people don't understand it and they also, um, with fatigue, often it's like, oh, I'm not sure it will happen to me. And so That's right. you want to be able to sit down with them and explain it, but more importantly, explain, you know, what would your wife say? Would she want that tool? Would your child want that tool? Um, I don't think there'd be a single family out there that wouldn't want um, to know that their dad or their mum you know, didn't have that camera in the, in the cab to protect them, you know, and that's what it is. It's, yeah. it's not for the company. And I think that a number of other cameras that have been sort of nitpicking and looking at drivers, um, you know, for different reasons have created a negative impact on cameras, yeah. full stop. So for us, we were aware of that. And so we, we, but we, we really wanted to obviously get on top of fatigue and, and, and be a leader in that space. So the, People's Council helped to talk to the staff and go through a number of iterations, which we did um, consulting. We yep. probably did more consulting than most um, to to get to a point. But there's a point where you know a number of people just needed the camera in their truck to actually see it work, and then find that it's actually not beeping all day. Yeah. And then yeah. They, our number one concern with the camera was it wasn't working. And I said, well, that's because you're not the team. <laughs> that's because you're doing, you're doing everything right. Yeah, yeah that's yeah, right. But yeah. that was our number one thing that came out of it, which was quite, quite hard. Is that so, right? Yeah, they just actually thought there was something wrong it was with a, it. It was failing. Yeah. yeah. But, um, that's, but that, what we, that's what we want. That's, that's what we want. That's exactly what we want. Yeah, that's yeah. cool. Yeah. Hey, um, that's brilliant. I mean, I've taken up way more of your time than probably anticipated, but these things do go on and on a fair bit. So uh, very insightful. Um, lots of amazing information. Thanks for sharing too. Um, you know what goes on here and, and what you do and how you go about it and, and giving your opinions on things um, you know we're hoping that it will uh, you know continue to manifest through more and more that we talk to and, and it, op- it gives an opportunity for other operators and, and you also maybe down the line to to see and hear and, and um, do some learning across the across the journey so I uh, really appreciate it Matt thanks awesome. for thanks Greg cheers. really appreciate your time Matt thank you everybody that uh, has listened to our first episode of The Depot um, really interesting for me fascinating talking to Matt Horan the CEO of Dines about uh, the driver shortage uh, how it's impacted their business and the innovative ways that they are recruiting drivers and providing them with a career pathway um, we really hope that you've all gained something from this chat and I know that um, he'd be only more than happy to um, discuss further or, or you know, support um, similar ideas that uh, you might have. Um, the idea of the podcast is to share this knowledge uh, and the issues within the transport industry um, as it's something you know, I don't think that uh, we do enough of. Uh, so whether you're a fleet manager, a truck driver, uh, a female in the trucking industry or the transport industry, an owner operator, um, if there's a theme that you'd like to hear about uh, or hear me talk about or interview someone about, then let us know. Um, or even if you'd like to uh, come on the depot and have a chat with me, then uh, get in touch. Just email the depot at autosense.co.nz. Um, now, if, you've lo- if you do like what you've heard today and you want to subscribe to the podcast, um, then you'll get alerts each time a new episode is up. Um, So that's it for today. Thanks obviously to AutoSense for um, creating the opportunity to make this happen. Um, Thanks again for listening and we look forward to bringing you episode two of The Depot really soon.